first, uh, Ms. Mills and Ms. Sheckford, on behalf of Health Systems, I apologize to you. You deserve so much better. Those harms were preventable, and health systems have done too little to prevent them. Indeed, we don't even have frameworks that allow us to think about how you would get to zero harm. Today, I want to share with you a framework, flawed, imperfect, will evolve, but hopeful. I mean, the themes we heard today, that they seem like they fall into two domains. One I would call the relational or the adaptive, that there's this hunger for being connected, but my voice isn't heard. I don't feel worthy. I'm not respected. And indeed, the vast majority of harm, somebody knows something's wrong, but they weren't listened to or didn't feel comfortable speaking up. And then we also heard the technical aspects of what needs to be done to create a learning and improving health systems. And I think Don's talk in the morning outlined what those capabilities are. What I'd like to do today is really three things. One is to prevent, present a framework about what those, how we put those things together in one system. Two, show some proof points, that this isn't just theory, that there's an amazing number of proof points. And then three, and most importantly, ask for your help to, for us to innovate at a more macro management and learning system level, because we're not going to get to zero harm with doing one-offs, that, that we have to start thinking, how do we pull this together? and iterate on those, build upon it, criticize it, but let's drive it together. And I will open with my deep belief that healthcare is love. And love is defined as an energy that uplifts and connects. And what that means is in all of us, we were born with it. So we all have inherent dignity, we have respect, we're worthy to, to speak our voice, we're brilliant, beautiful, and brilliant, and we could innovate together. And every one of the problems that we have in society, and particularly in safety, is a lack of love, an othering, of not hearing someone, of not thinking someone's worthy, of not breaking silos across government agencies or departments because we're, not, we're losing that innovative power. And that needs uh, to change, and it needs to change radically. Now, this isn't a soft thing. Let me be very clear. Love, as Einstein said, is the most powerful force in the universe, is strong enough for us to shine in our own light and to be under our spotlight to be accountable. This is, accountability is sorely lacking in healthcare, and love is strong enough for us to do both. So I'd like to share with you the journey that I began to do this on. About four and a half years ago, our <coughs> youngest daughter graduated high school, and my wife, who's also into safety, said, okay, it's time for us to look for a job. She got a job as chairman of pediatrics and pediatrician-in-chief at Rainbow Babies in, in Cleveland, where she was from. I took a job at United Healthcare as their SVP and then EVP CMO with the belief and passion that I want to improve value, and that organization scale will allow me to do that. I quickly realized that the financial levers alone are probably the most weak lever of any lever you can pull, and you'd never, it's never going to ha happen from there. And we had just built a house in Cleveland, so I came back and met with the two CEOs of the big health systems in Cleveland and said, I want to create a model that transforms value. Do you want it to do it? I said, we'll build upon all that I've learned from all of you, and so many of you would have learned over careers as an executive at Hopkins, as a researcher, as a policy person, and put it all together. And I selected university hospitals because, to me, to do this, the health system's most important values are that I am humble, curious, and compassionate. I respect others, and I'm willing to be accountable to improve myself, my community, and my, commu and my organization. And UH is by far that. So a little bit of context about this health system. It's a $6.5 billion health system in Northeast Ohio, 23 hospitals, a big ACO with maybe 700, a little under 700,000 uh, people, uh, 300 primary care sites, a home care, a hospice. And uh, at the time, <clears throat> a goal that was largely mission-less. It was serving its community, but mainly it wanted to meet a budget and it wanted to have its docs get its RVUs target. It was very Midwestern, 
But the beauty of it, there was no competing thing. So we came in there and said, we want to create the model for zero harm or a high value health system. Now, most of our clinicians don't know what the heck value means. So we just said, success is when we have people healthy at home rather than healing in hospital. And anything you're doing that moves in that direction, it's directionally the right thing, the, the, the right thing to do. And our transformation model had really three simple things about how do we lead with love. First is change the beliefs of both staff and managers. Second is to create structures and a culture where people belong to learning communities because we know innovation flourishes where you have a structure that allows promising practice to flow or innovation grows when we have the ability to have diverse ideas meet and mate and generate something. And then importantly, build a disciplined management system because we know good management matters and good management is almost entirely absent in, in, in healthcare. And that management was first to perform. That is, as you said, let's just do the stuff that we know works. Like this isn't like fancy. And none of this happened with technology. This was like shoe leather, a horrible EMR system that luckily we're changing. And then we'll transform and, and do other things. So what, what does this, this look like? And you, these, their voices are so telling of the feeling of lack of love. Every one of our employees in our organization, 35,000 people saying, your job is to improve value, and we need to start, stop believing that harm is inevitable and start believing that is entirely preventable. In other words, we could get to zero harm, and we mean zero physical harm, zero suffering, zero waste, zero in inequities. And just these examples that literally every hospital is an is an every employee work group, and often the most marginalized employees were the ones who've been vo whose voices haven't heard. We also needed to train and change the narrative of our leadership system. So literally, about three thousand thirty five hundred leaders started saying, um, "There's this experiment where if you put fleas in a jar, they'll immediately jump out. You put a lid on a jar, they're smart. They'll hit their head for two or three jumps." and then they won't jump as high so they don't hit their head. You take the lid off, and they don't jump out. We have treated our employees as fleas with a lid in a jar, and we've disrespected them, we've not believed in their brilliance, and we are taking that, that, that now. We need them to jump out of the jar and, and innovate. They have the capabilities. And we shared this story with them of Death Valley, where Death Valley, the most desolate place in the world, gets preciously little rain, it's always dry and the earth's cracked. But in 2004, it got a fluke rainstorm. And a month later, this is the same Death Valley, it was a carpet of these beautiful, amazing wildflowers, right? And what changed? Well, those seeds of brilliance and beauty were always there. They just needed to be watered. And so there's leader totally transforming our leadership style to say healthcare is command control and it fails miserably. What we need to do is unleash and inspire and get every employee innovated and driving, and, 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 and driving transforming. The second thing we need to do was build structures where people feel they belong. And we use the metaphor of a fractal. Now, our lungs are fractal, our VLI are fractal, capillary are fractal, fern are fractal, broccoli is fractal. Fractal are identical shape but varying size structures. And they operate by simple mathematical rules. Our simple mathematical rules was every higher level in the organization needs to create a table where every lower level has a voice. And that allows us to create or co-create goals, to have horizontal learning and vertical learning for accountability. So we've just built these fractals all over the place. It's, 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 uh, we're fractalized and the beauty of it is perhaps best summarized in this story from London in the late 1940s. You see, London used to be full of two types of songbirds, the red robins and the bluebirds. And they were really innovative creatures that used to peck through the tops of milk containers that were left on people's stoops. They sucked the fat out, and so they're really chubby, well-nourished birds until the milk companies changed their tops from cardboard and steeple to aluminum and flat. The birds needed to learn a new way of pecking. They had to tuck their beak a little bit differently. Both birds are equally smart. The robins are extinct in London now, and the bluebirds thrive. The difference is the robins are solitary birds. They have their stoop or their corner. We call it our department, our role, our hospital, and their wisdom never shared. 
The bluebirds are flocking birds. They fly strong and proud together. So that wisdom quickly spread in their flower today. And we challenged every one of our employees, you need to be bluebirds. And if you're seeing anyone acting like a robin, call it out and say, hey, we need, we, we, we need, to, we need to do it. And then finally, this isn't fluff, really disciplined management system. What does that mean? Is that we're tired of hearing plans like I'm going to train or I'm going to do something. Is everything we're working on, Across, now, this to give you this context, 23 hospitals, uh, uh, 1.5 million people being cared for, very clear outcomes and key results. A key results meaning what processes you're going to change. That their management system simply has not rocket science, basic management. Do you have clear goals or outcomes and role clarity and commitment of resources? Have you created enabling infrastructure where it's easy to do those key behaviors and you give feedback in real time? And real time means literally that day or next the week. And do you provide feedback at an individual clinician level? Right, not a hospital level, not just department individual clinician. Have you created that learning community? And do you have a transparency and shared accountability system? And too often accountability is a leader looks at someone and points their finger and blames them. Shared accountability was really clear in the leaders. You could only hold someone accountable first if you hold yourself accountable to set them up to be successful. That is, it's your job to build this management system to help them believe and belong. And I will coach you to do that, but this isn't pointing fingers anymore. So a few proof points. We organized this work into getting well, so preventative, I mean, excuse me, staying well, preventative, getting well, chronic, getting better, acute. We've defined defects in each of those and made them visible and designed them out. So defects in staying well, annual wellness visit. And all these data are from over 2019 to now. 14% 2019, 80%. Immunization rates going up despite COVID. Diabetes control going from 57% to 95%. Hypertension control, 62% to 92%. But I want to spend some on getting better, the acute system. One simple thing is we know 30% of every procedure is not needed. For spine, it's 44%. So we tell our surgeons, we're going to create centers of excellence that are meaning. You can't just call yourself a center of excellence. We have objective criteria. One is transparent reporting of appropriateness criteria. 50% of our spine surgeries were inappropriate, just didn't operate on them. You say, how do you stay in business? Because our business is value. Our business isn't doing unnecessary surgery. But some data, again, many of you have done ERAS. When our surgeons weren't operating, we developed protocols and spread this across 23 hospitals, 15 service lines. Crazy, crazy, unprecedented performance in how good it can be when you, you, you do this. And again, the love part is what drove it. The technical parts are the easiest part. Reduction in length of stay, you know, this is the equivalent of building 66 more beds so that we can provide access to our, to, to our, our, our community. In medication safety that you heard things, like we've been way too lax in this, just radical improvements in, in the, these various different components. In barcode scanning, in Alaris guardrail compliance, in reducing omnicell override. And again, the point is just from this point, radical improvement. And this was providing individual nurse compliance data and training, but expectation is you will be at 95% of these. We'll work with you, but not being 95% uh, is in the length of stay. Again, 23 hospitals around of length of stay. This is, many of you have, and we have independent physicians who I don't employ, not the easiest group to engage. No difference in the results because the expectation was you're going to be at the length of stay of our other doctors. We can choose how to do it, but not hitting it, it um, isn't an option. Mobility, it's one of the most potent things. It went to zero during COVID. Not there yet, but again, an inflection point. Readmission data, which we never thought was possible, why we combined post-discharge med rec with transition care management with a, a ch checklist. As all of these have checklists, as you know. I'm a checklist fanatic, but readmissions where we just tolerated harm and just saying, no, 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 our goal is zero. You keep iterating uh, on this. And then in our ACO performance, a 33% uh, reduction in our annual cost of care for 110,000 Medicare patients. I mean, we would solve our country's health care costs if these things saved while in, in, in improving quality just by driving this. And also, as you know, many of the opioid addiction in Northeast Ohio has hit so hard are from reservoir pills that people go home with, indeed the vast majority of them. So it just labeled this as a defect. 
in value and just, again, told all these teams, it's a defect in value, go design it out. And in our emergency medicine, in our surgery, in our uh, uh, internal medicine departments do, doing this. So my plead with you is we have to stop thinking that as health delivery systems, this is going to be solved as whack-a-mole or just doing individual projects. We need those, but we also need to innovate as how do we pull together a leadership and management system. Again, I call it this leading with love or living and leading with love as a way to drive radical performance and scale it. So I ask you if, if you're innovating at this level, share what you're doing because I think we need to really see what's working. Criticize this, build upon it, our tech people, let's automate it so it's more scalable, but let's start finally stopping having to apologize to Ms. Mills and Shackford and start showing them that zero harm could indeed move to be possible by leading with love. Thank you.